Hey everybody, welcome again to the Sally Allen podcast. I am so glad you're here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, as you know, this we use this platform um, to bring people in to share their stories of resilience. And today I have a really, really honored guest and I am so thrilled to have him on my show. And I'm gonna read, I, I hate to botch up people's introduction. So I have... <laughs> I have a little introduction. Dr. John S. Patrick is the CEO and clinical director of Las Vegas Pain Relief Centers, Integrated Relief Pain Relief and Ever Ready Health, right? Yes. Did I get that correct. right? Yeah, Did I get that yeah. right? Okay, yeah. I like to read it. Like it. the worst yeah, thing you can good. do is botch a people's name. That, that's right? actually um those three companies are designed uh, Nevada is actually what's known as a C Palm state. That means there's no business of medicine. So in order mm -hmm. for you to be uh, to be involved in medicine, a medical doctor has to own that company. And so I have a management company that manages that medical company and then manages my personal injury company that manages my professional athlete uh, treatment center that I have here too. And we have a few centers here and then soon to be Alabama, but we have, hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have six locations in Nevada, Las Vegas, and then one in big in Birmingham, Alabama. Wow, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So do you know why you're here today? What's that? Do you know why you're here today? Yeah. You told me, you said, <laughs> I'm going to, you asked me, I want you to come on the podcast and tell you your story of resilience. And I, like, I don't know if I, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I'm excited actually to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. So, so, you know, usually I, I, I tell people, um, I invite them to share stories of resilience. I get a little background on their stories and then I bring them, but f for you, I did some digging and research on you and your background is so impressive. You're doing so many things in our community and, and that really drawn me to, to, you know, to get you on the podcast. So I've been hounding you for a minute <laughs> to get you on here. But, but I know behind everything you've done, right, there's something that's driving you. So tell us your story. What's driving you, Dr. Patrick? You, you know, I... It's ironic that we're having this conversation right now because uh, just at dinner last night with my mother, she asked me some questions like, you know, uh, in your life, you know, we got a divorce. My mom and my dad got a divorce. And she said, how did that affect you? And I was, I, we were going through this whole entire story. And it comes back to, uh, for me, what, what is, is my biggest driver was being bullied uh, and, and being around someone that had a slight disability. My brother, my youngest brother, Jeff, uh, he had a slur, so when he was younger, he used to talk like, "Hi, I'm Sean's brother," and and I remember all the torment and and hassle he got uh, from other kids in the neighborhood that were making fun of him. They're just kids; they didn't really mean anything. But uh, but that, as well as myself being bullied, it had created a, a if you will, a, a vein inside of me that just said, "Wait, you know, not everybody. Uh, this isn't right, and this isn't this isn't fair." So I've kind of since literally since middle school. I've always had this uh, drive to make sure that there's justice in, in, in the world, if you will, or at least a little part of it in which I could control. So I've always wanted to help out. And for me, we, even during my political campaign, we used to have a saying that said, if serving is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. Mm. Uh, you know, and so I, I, I take that to heart. And, you know, the truth is we get 29,200 days on this planet if you live to be 80. And I'm not willing to give up one of them. I mean, it's a privilege and it is, we need to be grateful for every one of these days. And the true ex accent of hope is just setting that alarm every night, you know? So for me, I, I take advantage of every day uh, in my office. We don't have bad days. We may have bad hours or bad situations, but we're not allowed to come and go in, in my companies without having, you know, been grateful and be thankful. And at the end of the day, my, all of my teams leave happy and laughing. And that's really what it's about, not this rat race, you know, that we, we seem to be uh, on that treadmill. Wow. What a good start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I knew there was a reason why why I invited you to share, and and that's so inspiring. What what you just shared, Dr. Patrick. Um, one of the things, like, there are so many things you're doing. My head is spinning to going through, like, which one should I talk about? What should I do? But something you just said to me that resonated was, um, when I started, I said something always drives us. There is something in our past that drives us to do what we do today. So this is a nice segue into your your brother Jeff has a disability. Oh, he did. He outgrew it. He it was did. just he a simple slur. It. You yeah. know, it was tongue tied. Okay. But kids don't know that, right? So right. when he would speak, you know, there, he would have a little slight slur. So the kids would make fun of him. Uh, and I have a great mom story about that. You know, I, if you want to share with me, my brother was a 
staying at a friend's house up the street, and we lived out in the country at that time, so kind of like a gravel road, and this is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and my brother had spent the night, in the morning we were going to run to the store, which was you know 10 miles, 15 miles away, so it wasn't quick, we were just gonna sneak through the store, and then we we're gonna stop by and pick up my brother, but as we're backing out of the driveway with my mom, I could we looked up the street to where my brother was up the road, and we could see somebody coming down the road with a sleeping bag. And my mom's like, I think that's your brother. So she sped up the, the, the road, right? <clears throat> and yeah, sure enough, it was my brother. And he, he got to the car and he said, uh, you know, he was kind of crying. And he was dragging a sleeping bag and he got in the car. My mom said, you know, what? And she's, this is, this is the five foot Italian Carla <laughs> Tortelli woman here. Like, this is the tough <laughs> nails, right? If there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. if there's the heavy in the house, it's mom. So mm -hmm. she said, what happened? My brother said, you know, mom, they threw my sleeping bag in the pool and making fun of me. And I slept on the outside on the, on a, on a porch, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. So she said, you know, who, 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 what happened? So he kind of went through it and so we drive up to this house. So my mom's like, go get them and bring them out here to me you know so it was this whole thing escalated to where i i ended up at the door and the kid was very rude at the door and it ended up like you know two little boys fighting in the front you know kind of the front yard and the father coming out and saying i'm gonna call your mom and my mom yelling from the top of the drive you don't need to i'm right here and the bus stop is in my yard so if you want this to happen to your kid every day you better tell your kids not to make fun of my son so it was quite an experience and i got in the car and my mom grabbed kind of like the, my front of my shirt, not in a, a fierce way, but in a kind of like put her hand on my chest. And she said, you are your brother's keeper. Oh, and that wow. for me was just it. So forever since that day, I never forget it. It was always like um, I mean, any time that there was anybody that, you know, I, I just didn't like the injustice because it just wasn't fair. I knew how that hurt. It hurt us. So <clears throat> for me, it was just ever since that day, I've, I've set out to if I could find a wrong, I'm going to fix it. You know, and that's kind of how I've lived my life. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think we, what we don't realize is that those moments, they carry us into adulthood and sometimes they define who we are. Because I do coaching and a lot of my clients are coming with these uh, baggage, it's like a ball and chain around their waist that they carry throughout their lives about what somebody had said to them or, or something, it, because you're so impressionable at a young age. I call that a straw. Mm. Uh, if a, a drowning man will hold on to the straw because it's the one thing that he has and and if he just let go of the straw he could swim i like that so you know you just got to let sometimes i just say you know to myself john let go of the straw you know, what are you hanging on to you know i mean it's a big difference when you just hang on to it some people will drown yeah and it happens yeah. but you just got to let go of that straw sometimes so you can swim yeah and that's one of the things i've been helping my client with like one of like one of them was like a teacher told me that i'm not good enough and i'm not going to amount to anything and he carried that and he's still carrying it and it's so hard to release those. But I like what you said. I call it a ball and chain and it seems so heavy when mm -hmm. you say that as opposed to if you say it's a straw, you can just let go of it. Just let it float away. Let it go. Because most of the things truly, that's the weight of them. The, yeah. It's the weight that we give it. I love, you know, love If you just put that, that weight into yeah. it and, and, you know, you just kind of got to. Yeah, uh, I love oftentimes that. Oftentimes too, you know, we talked earlier a little bit about you mentioned I had written a book on Amazon, right? It's yes. A, yeah. Called Get Off Your Path. Yes. Uh, uh, 2015, I wrote the. It was kind of. I think I finished the book. Uh, it's on self sustainable living and how to live and eat healthy and all of those doctor thingies and yeah. stuff like that. Um, but that book actually came was inspired by a teacher. I'm dyslexic, terribly dyslexic, uh, and and it wasn't until really I got to medical school that I realized it wasn't a dis disability. It was a superpower. Mm. Now I can tell you every credit card number in my wallet. I can tell you my first address. So my brain has a different way of learning. And, and having battled through that, it was, I realized it was, an, uh, it was an athlete. So they back in my day, they wanted to pass athletes along, get them going. So I turned in a paper, and the teacher took the paper from me, and she said, uh, it's not as if you're ever going to write a book, John. And she wasn't being mean, mm -hmm. and she wasn't being that. She was like saying, look, just go, because I want you to play on Friday. <laughs> that team, <laughs> you know, that was kind of a thing. But for whatever reason, uh, that stayed with me. And I remember not being challenged by it in a bad way, but in a good way. And it wasn't, and, and, and I'm glad she said that to me, and I'm grateful, because what it did is it inspired me to say, oh, yes, I will. Yeah. And I took that as, and she didn't do it in a nasty way at all, but it was, it was a good thing. So now we've published a book. It's a three-time uh, bestseller, uh, three categories. Yeah. Thing, so it's good. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, I saw you. that. I did some stocking. I know. I know. <laughs> it's funny. I'm an open book. So 
that I love that phrase that your mother said, you're now your brother's keeper. And that did that propel you into starting your nonprofit? It's called Keep It Make Keep It Simple, Make It Fun. Yeah, at Kismif. Keep Kismif. it simple, make it fun. Yeah. Um, when I got here, um, and I'm I'm in 2000, 99, 2000 to Las Vegas. I came here from school with a mountains of debt, uh, no job. I had nothing other than a few articles of clothing and a, and a really beat up car. Uh, and when I got here, I mean, so poor I couldn't pay attention. You know, I mean, it was that kind of that kind of poor. And I, uh, I was staying with my parents, and I knew it because no matter what I had, was trying to get out there, wasn't working. And I kind of felt like I was trying to you know push water upstream. And I thought this isn't working. And then it was like I had I went to sleep and I woke up and I went, you got to give, you got to serve. So I started serving in the community from the Catholic charities. I had every almost six days a week I was out doing something in the community at that time, whether it be going to uh, City Adaptive Program, some great people with the City Program for people in wheelchairs or disabilities, cognitive or physical. I teamed up with them. Special Olympics, I did all the physicals for them and didn't charge them so that they could participate in the sports. Uh, you name it, I was in it. Lions Club, uh, everything. And, it, and I realized that that's an old saying that they, you know, and I say this all the time, they don't care how much you know until they know how much, much you care. care. And Sally, it led into people saying, hey, you know, let me come see you as a doctor or my cousin needs to see you. And then it spread into my own kind of, I had my own database of these people now that were seeking me out as, because I was serving them. Yeah. And then it built built my practice. And I used, later on, it got, I got so substantial that it was like literally a $100,000 a year or something I was giving away in services. And a friend of mine was really kind of beating me up for that and saying, yeah, you should probably change that. And I'm like, but do you realize what that's done in, in name recognition and opportunity? And I've met some yeah. of the most incredible people on the planet. Uh, you, you just can't put a value on it. And I am so grateful for those hard times. You know, uh, Joe, I think it was Jordan Peterson said something that really made sense. And I think it's perfect for your show that, you know, hard times make strong men and strong men make good times and good times make weak men and weak men make hard times. And we got to think about that. Yeah. Right. Because it's like, you know, it's the trials in our life and the tough times that we have that truly are what make us. And that's really what gives us the fiber to succeed. So it's it, I, I don't uh, disappreciate anything I've gone through. And, and I have gone through nothing compared to the wonderful people you've had on your show. Well, our story resonates differently with different people. Right. And and each of us have. um different things that we do. You, for example, you have a heart of gold and you start serving. It didn't matter what people say to you. Like normally, you know, out there, you, you know, the medical world more than I do. And you know, it's all about money. It's all about how much money you can make for the most part. Right. Um, but for you, that wasn't your driver. Just wanted to help people and that helped grow your business. It is no surprise to know that our medical system is predicated on profit. Yeah. I don't want to be a part of that system. You know, we ha <clears throat> that's one of the things why, for me, it was always that oath meant something. Yeah. I got to serve, do no harm. <clears throat> I got to love people. And it was really kind of a wonderful experience. And when you're around the medical community, you realize that the doctors really got themselves handcuffed. The insurance companies dictate the care now. You know, doctors, you know, the average doctor's visit is seven minutes. Radiologists look at a set of MRIs for four. And it's not their fault. They got mountains of debt and they're trying to do the best they can to survive. And most doctors that I know and work with love being doctors and we want to contribute and we want to have fulfillment. And when you were went into the medical profession, and we're talking for me in 1995 is when I started in school, my mindset was I want to love, I want to change the world. And you realize very, very fast that there are other things out there that that don't always make that so and part of that is how we've turned our health care which is still the greatest health care in the world people don't realize that and and i and i i believe that uh, we have some of the most and because of that because we have people from all over the world coming here and contributing so therefore you have the greatest from everywhere i believe that's why it's good but as long as we keep putting dollars in front of people we're going to struggle and You've we've seen that in the last couple of years with COVID and what's transpired and everything that's gone down with that. And so I, I like to see the more of the doctor's house calls. I like that kind of feel. I love my patients. Some of my best and greatest relationships come from the interaction and the connection and trust that you build. I always tell patients that, you know, next to your spouse, your, your medical person should be the person you know and trust and love the most. And if you don't know and trust and love them, find a new one. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. don't don't be a number. Advocate for yourself. If you don't advocate for yourself, why would you expect somebody else to? So don't be mistreated. Go there, ask for help. And if you do, it's our job to educate. That's what our, that's what a physician means is the educator. So we're supposed to be educating people and telling them and treating them so. Tell us a little bit about your organization. Um, keep it simple, make it fun. That's my love. <clears throat> Kismet is something we started in 2008, 2009. It was a bridge off of the City Adaptive Program. We take people with physical and cognitive disabilities and get them outside. Yes, I said outside, which is still <laughs> contrary to our current lives. You know, everybody's on a phone inside. Yeah. But we want, you'd be surprised. Uh, there are 60 million Americans in wheelchairs, Sally. And they're the most underserved, underappreciated uh, population. And that's a lot of people that have adaptations that into their lives that people don't really understand. And I started looking at this and realizing, man, they don't, nobody, when you lose your legs, let's say you're something, you're in an accident and tragedy happens, everybody in the world or everybody that cared about you shows up that day or that week. Mm -hmm. Then they're gone. And the person is living with this permanent nature of this situation realizes that the friends that you have stop calling they, they, because it's come somewhat of maybe a little bit on their heart. Mm -hmm. And there's adaptations like, let's bring Tom, but you got to get his chair in the car, or whatever these things are. So I'm not saying that the friendships aren't great, but it does put a strain on it. And there's a lot of depression that goes along with this. And there's a lot of things that happen with this. And when you lose your legs, who teaches you to drive with poles? Do you know there's not a pro program out there that really teaches people in wheelchairs, at least not in Nevada, I found, to use poles to drive again. They gotta do that on their own. And there's not a, I mean, where, do you, where does a person in a chair find someone to give them a ramp so they can get in their house? Yeah. And how many companies out there retrofit a home so that somebody in a chair can, and where you put the light socket? If you put the light socket in the standard place, that's they would say by code, if you're in a chair, you gotta bend way over, almost fall out of your chair, and that's assuming that you have abdominal muscles to get you there. See, there's things that we're not doing as a society that bother me, and that's one of them. Is we're not. Let's ask those in chairs well, how we can make their lives better. Let's ask those people that are struggling in those areas and improve it. And so for me, Kismith is something we take people outdoors. We just got involved with KKR, Kyle Keller Racing. Yeah. Uh, we're going to build a, and we're raising money now for a race car to make it an automatic so that we can have people in wheelchairs ride around a track and go as fast as they possibly want and enjoy it and give them that independence that has been taken from them. Let's give them back that opportunity to have salvation and freedom and autonomy. Let's give them that. And that's what my nonprofit does. If you want to sit around a campfire, cool. You want We, we kayak down Lee's Ferry, 14-mile kayaking underneath the Grand Canyon around Horseshoe Bend uh, and with some friends in chairs and some people with disabilities. Uh, but I, I, this isn't something that I do. I have a, I, we took in a roommate, my daughter and I, nine years ago that had a traumatic brain injury. His home life was terrible. He uh, was coming to our group after a motorcycle accident. He was a friend before the accident, and after the accident, uh, my nonprofit helped get him out and get him involved, and he had a terrible TBI, and his home life was bad, and it was really best that he come live with my daughter and I. So he's Uncle Mark. He's a brother. My mother treats him like a son. He's been with me for eight years, and we're, he's my best friend. And, uh, you know, it's uh, I help him. He had a stroke, and he has epilepsy and stuff, and... But, you know, where God takes something away, he gives you something else. And, you know, Mark was probably a good mechanic. He's a better one now. It's like you'd mm. be surprised at the things that he still can do. And his speech is a little interrupted at time from time. And, you know, train of thought kind of gets lost. But for the most, we put him in the hyperbaric chamber. We adjusted him. We did some ballooning work on, a, on all kinds of stuff for Mark. And, and now I think we take care of each other. You know, he's a good friend. Um, he takes care of the dogs and, you know, takes care of, you know, the house when I'm gone and I travel a lot uh, with all the things we have going on. And so I, it's not something that I just, you know, I don't I don't take a picture with a person with a disability for some photo op or some prop. Yeah. OK, I, I live it every day. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that separates probably separates me from a lot of people is the fact that I don't I don't talk. I just I, I walk the walk. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And how different Mark's life would have been. Have you not taken him under your care? Well, it, it just more, more than care, just friendship. Yeah, really, friendship, really yeah. friendship. Because yeah. you know, Mark takes care of himself. He does his deal. Uh, he's got his things. He can't work, but you know, mm -hmm. it's like it's it's a good situation. We rescued each other. Honestly, you know, I'm a I'm a very busy person, and sometimes you know, loneliness creeps up on us all. And knowing Mark's always there, and you know, and there's times where I always have a, a set of ears to talk to, or 
he probably wishes that there was probably a lot less than it happened to <laughs> listen to me. But Gotta he's listen a great to John guy. again today. <laughs> That's right. He's ranting about no, he he hangs on. He sees all the things. He's like, okay, we got a screenplay, got another book, you got this going on. We're just doing a racing team. And the racing team that just to kind of segue back into that, the racing yeah. team we have is for KKR, started a diversity racing program. Uh, for the longest time coming out of the deep south where NASCAR and a lot of racing programs got started and on their birth, uh, it really was a, a, you know, a very non-diverse uh, group of people that were involved in racing. Now it's just, it's incredible. We're bringing, and it was because any time that you can bring out the best in anything, you're going to push the sport further or you're going to push that opportunity further. So yeah. uh, we started, the, they started this KKR, uh, Kyle Keller Racing uh, Diversity Program, and, and we jumped on board immediately and said, I want to get a car for my friends in chairs and people that have disabilities. I would like to work with you guys for minorities more involved in the sport. And now you're seeing that all around. We were out at the track on Sunday and you saw so many different people uh, various different cultures and aspects. You saw everybody, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. It was, it was America. So the car, and I didn't get that as I was going through your social media. The car is specifically for people with disability. We we no right now oh, we're a part of a in. legit racing team. We're going to okay, be in you're, Phoenix. You are part of it. Part okay. of the Arca circuit. We we're in Phoenix on Friday or Friday yes yeah, for our okay, race. Yeah. We fly back Saturday, race here at the Bull Ring, and then I fly back to Phoenix on Sunday for the Na big NASCAR race. And 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 so we're 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 a full fledged racing team. But we are starting the diversity racing program. They have a Kyle already has uh, some kids that he's working with. Cam Calloway out of uh, uh, out of uh, Sacramento area, I think he is, and then some kids here. I want to bring in the diversity side for the people of the adaptive. I want to bring in the people in chairs, the people with head injuries who just want to ride again, or they want to be in a car and it feels like when it goes fast again. Yeah. And, and there's just that, that feeling of speed, right? That people just love. And so I want to bring that in. So the car that we have out there, they're, they're racing cars. We have several cars. Uh, the next car we build, we want it to be an automatic because you can't leave the hands off the wheel in a race car. Right. So we want them to work the paddles, but it's got to be an automatic because they can't shift. So it's it's a it's a refurbished vehicle. We're going to take an old old car if we can get one, and we're going to uh, kind of transform it into an adaptive car, and that'll be the Kismith car. And then anybody that's uh, you know, as my roommate, just to give you an example, Mark was in a. Yamaha, uh, you know, motorcycle accident. Mm -hmm. But if you ask him today, he can't wait to get back on the bike or he can't mm -hmm. wait to get on a four wheeler. So uh, it's, it's, it's just getting them back to normality. Let's bring back a little bit of the civility in our country and yeah. a little bit of normality in their lives. Yeah. So what spurred that idea with the racing car and, um, you know, trying to get them in the racing car? I have loved racing and speed my whole life. Um, I was inspired by it. I've been a big fan forever of racing and an opportunity came up and I'm around lots of big groups and things and have lots of opportunities like this, very, very blessed and, and fortunate. But it was the diversity program that sought me out. It was so interesting how that came about again. That's my, everybody knows that's who I am. They happen to have a diversity racing program, so I'm in. Yeah. So that's yeah. really what spurred it on was that it was, it gave me an opportunity to be a part of something, not just the racing team. I could do that. You know, I could go get cars and stuff like that. That's not the point. The point is that the, the bringing something new, bringing something and making a change where I could see that it fit my, my mantra, who I am. It felt kind of where we already were in the space yeah. I'm occupying. And then you, I love racing. Sing, and I can do diversity stuff. Oh yeah, I'm in. Great, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So that's what it is now. So it's a busy season. We're out at the Bull Ring almost. Um, I think every other Saturday, if the Bull Ring's out by Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Yeah. It's inexpensive, Sally. That's one of the things we got to get back to the things of what brings families together. Yeah. And right now, especially these days, everything's so expensive. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, two people out is 150 bucks. It's like everything is nuts. So I love it because they kept the cost of the track and the seats down. So it's a little dry, but hey. Get out with your family. Get out of the house. Go out to the track. Support us. So yeah. we do. Uh, we're great to be on there. We have our ever ready car. This yes. part of the season, beautiful car. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank <laughs> you. It was beauty. actually NASCAR featured it out at the track this last weekend. So four hundred thousand yeah. people got to see our set of wheels, and that was cool. Yeah. Uh, but midway through the year, we're going to switch to another one of our companies, uh, which is Integrated, which handles personal injury cases. Uh, so we handle if you were injured in a car accident. You know, we always say go see a doctor first. We work out the rest later. We work off of liens. You know, people, when they're injured, so the first thing they do, especially in and around town, is they rush for an attorney. And it's like, again, back yeah. to get fixed again, first, yeah. money later. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're, we're trying to change that paradigm for people's thought. 
uh, you know, don't look as at a traffic accident as necessarily always as a, a bad signs, thing or a good yeah. thing, but just get your body taken care of first. You know, let's put you back together before you start looking at who to sue. You know, the litigious nature of everything. And I'm not discrediting any attorneys. We work with so many wonderful attorneys, but we always say get care first, health care first, attorney second. Yeah. That's the model I'd like to see because it's really what matters most, uh, not necessarily from a business standpoint, from my heart standpoint. So Yeah. <clears throat> So I'm going to ask this question, but I think I already know the answer to it based on everything you've told me, but I'll still ask it. Why from physician to politician? Well, my father, my stepfather was a colonel in the Marine Corps. He flew yeah. jets. Uh, and he, I had the, kind of like the, the two dads. My what real dad was a cowboy in Ohio. My stepfather was a colonel in the Marine Corps. One was a gentleman, one was a guy. And um, it really came down to it as the love for country the appreciation, the understanding of what it means to serve. Um, and I really fell in love with the Marine Corps because I had such an incredible influence from my stepfather. When COVID hit in, the, in, in 2020, uh, OSHA had come into our office and was wanting to you know, fine us, shut us down, was essential, non-essential, and all that nonsense started. They were going to, you know, kept slapping fines on us and were like, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I, they didn't have warrants to be in my place and they needed them. They didn't have subpoenas to interview my staff and they needed them. And it realized, wait a second here. You know, I could sit around and talk a bunch of smack uh, about knowing my rights, but I didn't know them. Mm -hmm. And the truth was I knew probably more than what most did, but I didn't know them. So I took it upon myself. And I said, that's it. I'm never, this is never going to happen again to me. I took over 400 hours of constitutional historical document training during COVID. So while you know, we were, and we continued to work, I didn't mandate vaccines to my staff or my patients. I didn't require masks for my staff or my patients. I'm vehemently opposed to any of it. Do what you want to do. Don't force it on me and my family. Don't force it on my staff. Don't force it on the people. There's a lot of stuff that's going to happen here soon. You're going to see it. Cardiovascular risk is up. In 20 years of practice, I maybe had five acute cases of tachycardia or myocarditis and people under the age of 35, we probably get four or five a month wow. now. So things are changing. I'm not going down that rabbit hole with right. you on, on this show, but um, when they came in, I said, I'm not doing this. And I started looking at the holes in, in the parties. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a staunch uh, conservative. I'm a Republican. I'm very proud of it. Yeah. But I know, what it's, I know what it is to be a Republican. And that's because right. I, I know the history of it. And I thought, you know what, this, this isn't making sense. There are people that are serving in Carson City right now that have never read the Nevada Constitution. There are people in Washington, D.C. that can't tell you, 50% of them can't tell you what's in the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. So that fired you up to run for office. Yeah, I need we need integrity on that bench. Yeah. We need integrity out there in Carson City. Look what's happening to our country. Really, look at the moral fibers. Just it's, yeah. ran, it's it's almost gone. We don't have respect for each other anymore. There's no decorum. There's no. I mean, it used to be where politicians would have class. Now they have no class. And I'm not trying to pick, pick anybody out. Right. And we sh all should be appalled at this. We should hold ourselves to a higher standard. Isn't that what we want for our politicians and our people? Not that they're different or they're supposed to be uh, something special. But you as a politician should want to hold yourself to a higher standard. That doesn't mean you can't be who you are, because that's our whole thing in our campaign was authenticity. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. we're, We have to be authentic. And I'm going to be who I am, and I'm going to challenge and fight. And that's how we're going to get it done. But uh, I'm going to run again. I'm running again. I have some new campaign teams. I'm going to be with Axiom, which is a campaign consulting uh -huh. team here. Yeah. Uh, Ray Serrano, Morgan Schulte. Um, <clears throat> I had a campaign manager by the name of Erica Sage. She did a fine job in my previous campaign. Uh, I... Uh, it's our campaigns. A lot of times people don't realize that. It's up to the candidate. See, what I right. one of the things that kind of really makes me upset is candidates join politics and they think that they're going to get a bunch of support. You haven't earned it yet. You got to get there first. So it's all on our shoulders. You can't blame somebody else for not winning. Like, I lost, but I'm a challenger. I, I, I want to fight. I love, I love it. It's not winning and, and learn. It's not winning and losing. It's winning and learning. So what do we do right? What do we do wrong? What are we going to work on? So I'm back. I'm going to be running for Assembly District 21. Uh, we're already starting to start you know, doing some good things in the community so people can see the good work that we do, not just mm -hmm. that I'm a politician. I'm a real human being and that I love Nevada. I love Las Vegas and I love the people in my community. And I want to serve them before I'm elected. So right. that way, and it's not about legislating them, Sally. It's leading them, and people right. want leaders they can trust and they can believe in again. You know, God, I, I welcome the days of JFK when he stood on the podium and people they loved the guy. You know, and, and we saw that with Trump too. For the most part, the people who loved him loved him, and the people who hated him hated him. Right. And regardless of how you feel about that, but he led the country, 
I mean, that was the thing. He let it. I mean, made everybody, good or bad, he made everybody think. He made everybody pause. And people that never knew anything about politics, good or bad, because of Trump, really started to pay attention. So I, 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 I applaud him for that, especially for that. Well, thank you for sharing. And we look forward to see you running in the race and running as yourself, authenticity. I like that. Yeah. Being yourself and um, showing people who you really are. I think one of the things we don't do enough is stop and listen. And we need to listen to what people want. Every yeah. consumer, you know, they you have to really always mm -hmm. look at that is that when you pay attention to the people you're speaking to, you know, that's why they always that old saying, God gave us two ears and one mouth. That's so. right. Listen more, talk less. Dr. Patrick, this was fun and we could go on and on, but what's the takeaway for our audience today? I'd probably say the, the biggest takeaway is that just because someone's a politician, don't believe everything that you hear in regards to you know what's out there. There are a lot of politicians in the state of Nevada and around the country that really want to make a change with all of their hearts and everything that we're doing. So don't pay attention to a lot of the gossips out there, a lot of people. I stay out of all that stuff, really, so it's like there's, there's nothing really out there about me. But I hear it all the time in the political realm that you know this person, that person. Just know that they're people. Politicians are people, and we're all trying to do the best we can with the information provided. Uh, and another takeaway is that if uh, go to f advocate for yourself in a medical situation, I really want to get back to that medical advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, really stand up for yourself. You know, the, again, medical is predicated on profit and but stick up for yourself medically and you know get out do something for the community if take away something is that if you're not happy go change something you know sally there are thousands of books in the library on self-help oh yeah. yeah there are almost no books in there to how to help others Believe yeah. it or not, there aren't. How do you help somebody become successful? How do you yeah. help somebody out of this depression? But there's all kinds of books to help me. So I say, try to knock on your neighbor's door. They just may need it just at that time. Say hi to people. Uh, don't believe the media. You know, the media is it's not what it says we are. We're not that. We're not a nation of hate. We're not a nation of bigotry. We're mm -hmm. a nation of love, and we're a nation of pride, and compassion, and caring. And there's nothing greater. There's no human being on the planet who strives harder for the independence and the equality of all men than the American. So just be proud to be an American. That's the takeaway. Be proud to be American. Thank you. Thanks again, Dr. Patrick, for sharing your story and sharing your heart on our podcast. I felt your heart coming through and who you really are, your authenticity coming through today. So thank you for sharing that. And remember, if you're listening to our podcast, rate, review, and share with your friends.